Hey everyone, this is Nick and today's Linux and open source news video is all about the Linux desktop and Linux hardware. Because we have System76 sharing more progress on their Cosmic desktop which looks almost ready for an alpha release. We have Linux Mint implementing some theming changes and we have System76 again working on their own laptop designed from the ground up. Just like I designed this segue to today's sponsor. This video is sponsored by Tuxcare and if you run CentOS machines you might be starting to panic about the fast approaching end of life of CentOS 7. Well you don't have to worry anymore because thanks to Tuxcare you can still get up to 4 years of free vulnerability patches for your CentOS 7 devices after you purchase a Kernel Care Enterprise subscription. So not only do you get live patching for the servers to stay secure and up to date without any downtime or reboots or maintenance windows to plan around, but you can also keep your current operating system so you can plan your upgrade path. Check out Kernel Care Enterprise and get your free extended support for CentOS 7 by clicking the link in the description. So PopOS shared more details about their cosmic desktop. And it's shaping up really nicely with System76's CEO saying it's close to being ready for their internal design team to use as a daily driver and that they still have a few workarounds to replace before moving on to an alpha release. First is their launcher, their Spotlight equivalent, which got a bit of a redesign compared to the current one implemented in GNOME, sitting higher on the screen, closer to the top panel, with nice rounded corners. They also explained that they won't have a separate full screen mode for applications, although apps that have their own full screen implementation like web browsers will work as normal. They instead say that maximizing will respect all your auto hiding settings. So if you decide to have the top panel and dock auto hide when a window overlaps them, you'll have a true full screen experience when just maximizing a window. They are also close to feature parity with their GNOME desktop when it comes to tiling, with hints and configurable window gaps now being supported. They developed an API to let app developers implement animations in their Cosmic apps, developed using Iced, and they improved performance for LibCosmic, their widget library. They also worked a lot on their window manager and compositor, which now supports drag and drop. They added community developed optimizations to it, including improved Nvidia support. And they're actually saying that it's working pretty darn well on Nvidia systems. Oh, and they also optimized the performance for X Wayland to use less CPU. Now, all in all, it seems to be moving at a very, very nice pace. And it looks like it's almost alpha quality ready. Now, I must say I am pretty excited for Cosmic. I think it will bring a breath of fresh air to our Linux desktops with another vision of a Linux desktop. And since System76 is working and developing their own hardware, it also means that it's probably going to be more optimized and less resource heavy than its competitors. Now, it looks like Linux Mint will not settle on the changes they made to their theme and icons in their latest version, which were definitely very Windows inspired. First, it seems users did not like the colored stripe on folder icons, which will then be removed in Mint 21.2. They will also remove the brown color options from their list of themes to reduce clutter, since that list is getting very, very long. They also replaced the monochrome dark gray icons in the app menus with symbolic icons, which should appear much more legible when using a dark theme. And more importantly, they will add the ability to select a style more easily than sifting through that long list of themes. Basically, you will choose the general theme like Mint Y or the legacy versions of that theme. Then you'll pick dark, light or mixed mode. And finally, an accent color to go with it. This means you won't have to parse a big menu with every option, but you'll have a more streamlined panel to apply these colors and looks. There will still be advanced settings if you like to mix and match window manager themes, icon themes and the like. And they will also add an Ubuntu-like color scheme, very reminiscent of Yaru, with dark gray folders and orange accents. Theme creators will also probably be happy to learn that they will be able to create styles that fit into this new panel by creating a JSON file. Mint 21.2 is planned to release at the end of June. 
Now these are interesting changes. I personally really like the new theme that Linux Mint implemented in 21.1 and this new style selector will probably make it on par with what Ubuntu offers or what KDE has. Now the only one missing an accent color selector is GNOME and yeah I've seen they're working on some prototypes of that but come on it's really needed now. Okay, let's go back to System76 because it seems that they're working on their own laptop design. The company currently sells laptops based on chassis designed and built by other companies. But since they already designed their own desktops, it was only a matter of time before they applied that process to laptops. Carl Richel, the CEO of the company, teased a few pictures of an LCD panel being milled out of aluminium and of a keyboard top plate for a device code named Virgo. Going into more detail, he said they would work with suppliers to make the parts according to System 76's design, much like most hardware companies do. They design the parts and specifications and they contract out the production of these to various manufacturers before assembling them into working devices. They apparently already own machines for lasering, milling, 3D printing and painting in their factory in Denver, so I guess they will still do a bit of the work themselves. They also apparently want to stick to the keyboard layout they created for the launch keyboard with its split space bar, three key sizes and they're experimenting with a low profile mechanical keyboard for that future device. And of course the reasoning here is simple. If you really want to tailor the experience to what your consumers want, you have to design your own laptop from the ground up. When you use a chassis designed by Clevo or Tongfeng, you might get some pretty awesome products because those are really good laptops. But it also means that you don't have full control over how the trackpad is centered, the keyboard layout, the keyboard itself. You can just replace a few components and pick different parts that are compatible with Linux. Now, as the latest release of the Linux kernel added better support for Apple Silicon, even though it wasn't full mainline support for most recent Macs, version 6.4 will continue this work and add more Asahi Linux reverse engineered drivers, this time for the M2 chips. It will specifically bring the same level of compatibility for M2 devices as already exists for the M1, M1 Pro, M1 Max and M1 Ultra chips. So it will support NVMe, PCIe, managing the CPU frequency and a bit more. But it is still missing support for the Wi-Fi and Bluetooth chip, USB, keyboard and trackpad and video output for the Mac mini. As previously mentioned, if you want to run Linux on an Apple Silicon Mac, your only real option right now is to stick with Asahi Linux or at least use their kernel. And it's still in alpha state right now, not everything is stable. But it's still pretty cool to see their hardware being passed on to the mainline Linux kernel as it improves. So once again, props to the Asahi Linux team. The work they accomplished to reverse engineer everything from those chips without any documentation or specification is simply incredible. The Elementary OS team shared a progress report on the updates to Elementary OS 7 with many bug fixes and improved stability. The sideloading app that lets you install Flatpak apps and their respective remotes was tweaked a little to avoid painting these apps as untrusted, but instead asking if the user wants to trust them. It also now shows a bit of text depending on the permissions the app requires, notably when it needs a lot of them. And they plan to be more precise about that in the future. The pretty good Elementary OS mail client got some fixes, notably for crashes, and the online accounts should now more accurately set your username when configuring an SMTP account. The terminal app got a lot of polish for its shortcuts, context menus and URL support and the window manager should better handle notifications and will show them in the multitasking view now. They also released an update to their Flatpak platform, so elementary app developers have the latest base to focus on. It's rebased on the GNOME 44 platform, as both desktops use GTK, and it improves support for apps that use libadvita. So it's not a feature heavy month for elementary OS, but it's still nice to see that that desktop is getting some love and some support on its semi rolling release model. Now, while GNOME is focused on libadvita, it doesn't mean GTK, the underlying library for GNOME, Mate, XFC, elementary OS and more, isn't getting some love. 
The next version, 4.12, is shaping up to be a sizable one with good additions. The big one is support for Wayland fractional scaling. It will be experimental for the hardware accelerated renderers, those using Vulkan or OpenGL to draw the contents of a window, but it's still a nice step to get true fractional scaling without blurriness, because the current implementation is just rendering at the nearest integer, like 1x or 2x, and scaling it down or up, which can lead to some fuzzy edges and not super precise pixels, notably for text or small icons. They also improved support for textures, which are used notably in image viewers to paint the images on screen, and applications will now have more control over the filtering of these when they're scaled up or down. Finally, GTK 4.12 will also revamp some widgets to replace the old GTK tree view with GTK list view, column view, and grid view. These widgets were already available but not completely ready, although the grid view one is what enables the file picker in GNOME to display image thumbnails. Now these widgets will get bug fixes, better keyboard navigation, and more, and so they are ready for prime time to be used by other apps. And WebKit GTK is also getting hardware accelerated compositing under Wayland in its next stable release, which means better performance on any web view or in Epiphany, which is cool. And if everything I just said sounded like gibberish, just know that it means that every desktop taking advantage of GTK will get better performance, more features, and app developers will be able to build better apps. That's about it. Okay, let's finish this with the gaming news. Halo Master Chief Collection now officially supports the Steam Deck and Linux, including playing multiplayer matches. They enabled support for easy anti-cheat, which means everything should be fully playable. And they also said they want to continue to improve compatibility with the Steam Deck. And that's good, because there are apparently a few issues still, like selecting the wrong option to enable or disable anti-cheat support at launch, and potential freezes and crashes. Hello MCC is now listed as playable on the deck instead of unsupported. And on the other side of the spectrum, The Last of Us Part 1 is now listed as unsupported on Steam Deck. After a very rough start on PC in general, whether it was through Proton on Linux or on Windows natively, Naughty Dog said they would prioritize general fixes and patches before working on Steam Deck compatibility specifically, which is understandable. Might as well put out the fire before you fine-tune for specific devices. And talking about the deck, it looks like it's going to pass the 3 million units sold mark this year. And compared to console numbers, it might seem small, but we have to remember that this is a brand new device that started a whole new category of handheld PCs and consoles that seems to have a bright future. And it's 3 million more Linux users in the world, by that metric, it's an insane success. And naysayers might say that no, it's not that impressive, but it is. It's definite proof that Windows isn't the be-all, end-all for Windows gaming. Linux has a big part to play in this niche, and that's pretty awesome. Awesome, like our sponsor. If you're a Linux user and your computer is due for a replacement, then stop buying devices that were made to run Windows and praying and hoping that your favorite distro will run well on them. Buy something that supports Linux out of the box. Tuxedo makes computers that do just that. They're based in Germany, but they ship to most countries in the world. And they have a big, big range of devices that should suit every price point and every need. Every device is heavily configurable at launch, including adding your own logo on the lid of your laptop or even engraving your own keyboard layout on the keys of your laptop. And all their laptops are openable, repairable, upgradable, where you can replace the battery, the RAM, the SSD, and sometimes even the wireless card. So if you need a new computer and you plan to run Linux on it, and you want to support Linux's development on hardware, then click the link in the description below and get yourself something from Tuxedo. They're really good. So thanks everyone for watching the video. I hope you enjoyed it. If you did, don't hesitate to like, to subscribe, to turn on notifications, to write a comment. And if you didn't like the video, well, you can always dislike it and tell me why in the comments as well. And if you really like the channel and you want to support it, there are plenty of links in the description of the video for LibraPay, PayPal, YouTube thanks, YouTube memberships, Patreon, whatever, you know the drill. So thanks everyone for watching and I guess you'll see me in the next one. Bye.